Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hi, y'all, and welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 159. Yeah, I just had to try on my y'all for size because I am now, well, at least part Texan. Now, I'm trying to remember if I told you here on the show that my daughter and her husband and yes, my grandsons, Davey and Joey moved to Texas earlier this year. If I didn't mention it, it's probably because I was in a state of shock when it happened. It, It all happened so fast. And in about a month flat, they had sold their house, bought a new one down in Texas, and my son-in-law landed a new job. They were on their way. And of course, we were really excited for them because it was such a great adventure and a great move in their life. But it was sort of funny how it all worked out because Bill and I have been talking about considering moving to Texas for a couple of years, and yet here they were, they were doing it first. In uh, early July of this year, their new home was finally ready to move in. So I decided to hop a flight and I went down to help with the kids so they could kind of concentrate on moving. And I was down there for about a week and I thought, okay, maybe I will call up their real estate agent. And yeah, you can guess the rest. (laughs) Um, We found the perfect place and we made an offer. And that was pretty amazing because my husband had never seen the house. He'd seen pictures, he'd seen iPhone videos, but he'd never actually seen it in person. In fact, not until we became official owners. But, you know, after nearly 30 years, I think I know what he likes. And I was pretty convinced that he was going to love this place. Um, But I can now admit that I was hugely relieved when he finally saw it and he confirmed my choice. But I wasn't totally content until, of course, Davy and Joey gave their seal of approval. And it was a big old thumbs up. Since we've only moved about half of our California home furnishings to Texas, um, because we're going to still be splitting our time between the two for a while yet, um, probably until early next year, it's now looking like. It, it's kind of an empty house. I mean, there's a little bit in there, but it's fairly empty. But Davey loved it because the hardwood floors are perfect for racing matchbox cars from one end of the house to the other. And Joey liked it pretty much for the same reason, except for him. Now, he's a year old now. In fact, we were just down there for his first birthday. Um, he loved it because there is such an echo that he can crawl around singing and making noises and hear his glorious voice echoed. It's exactly the home that we wanted and uh, certainly a wonderful place to look forward to retiring in as well. I'm not retiring anytime soon, <laughs> but um, it, it's it's going to be a wonderful place to kind of take on the next phase of our life. We have a beautiful, quiet acre out in the country. And of course, an acre to a three-year-old like Davey is a huge amount of freedom. It, it, to him, it just looked like a farm, I think. Uh, to me, with grandchildren playing and my family around me, it is simply heaven. And it's the perfect place to be inspired to pursue my family history. My great, great grandmother, Lori Ann Green, was from Texas, and I have many trails to travel to uh, follow her and her life. And I look forward to having you follow me through the process also of creating my brand new office. I'm excited in the coming months to cover organizational strategies for both paper and digital genealogical materials, which I'll be dealing with, as well as organizing a book library and investigating the kinds of hardware that it takes to make it all flow. So hoping you'll enjoy going along with me on that ride. But for now, let's jump into the genealogy news and talk about what's been happening in the last couple of weeks. Seems like Canada has been in the news a lot lately. I know we have lots of listeners up in Canada. And um, if you have Canadian kin, you will be pleased to hear that the 1825 census of Lower Canada is now searchable online. And uh, the 1921 census has come on as well. Now, the 1925 census of Lower Canada counted nearly half a million people. Heads of households were actually named with other members of the household counted by category. You can search by household name or geographic location. The 1921 census counted 8.8 million people in thousands of communities across Canada. According to the Library and Archives Canada blog, the population questionnaire had 35 questions. 
The census also collected data on agriculture, animals, animal products, uh, fruits not on farms, manufacturing and trading establishments, and a supplemental questionnaire for persons who were blind and deaf. And this represents a total of 565 questions. The census was released this past June 1st of 2013 from the National Statistics Office to the Library and Archives. That office is processing and scanning the nearly 200,000 images for public use, and it hopes to have them posted very soon. Now, we think of Canada as a real melting pot today, or kind of a salad bowl as they prefer. Um, that wasn't always the case. The 1825 census of Lower Canada counted mostly Europeans of French extraction. And in 1901, 70% of Canadians claimed either British or French heritage. But in the first two decades of the 1900s, a huge immigration boom occurred that reached well beyond England and France. So the folks who show up in the 1921 census represented a newly multicultural Canada. You can start looking for your Canadian ancestors in the Library and Archives Canada's Popular Census Indexes, which includes that 1825 census and a new version of the 1891 census. And I'll have a link for that in the show notes. And if your family arrived in Canada after the 1921 census, check out the website for the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, where a million immigrants landed between 1928 and 1971. And of course, as I mentioned, the much anticipated but little publicized 1921 Canadian census is now online and available for browsing at Ancestry.ca. And they anticipate releasing an index later this year. When you click on the first link, which I'll have for you in the show notes, you'll see that Ancestry.ca's collection of Canadian census data goes back to 1851. Thankfully, it is getting just a little easier to find your Canadian ancestors online. And uh, there is even more genealogy television out there. If you've been enjoying Who Do You Think You Are this summer as I have, uh, you'll probably look forward to uh, the Genealogy Roadshow. Uh, it's filming right now. It's going to be airing this fall on PBS. Uh, this clever show follows a format similar to the popular Antiques Roadshow you've probably seen, in which antiques experts travel to various cities to talk about artifacts brought in by area residents. Well, residents may lug in, you know, a tall grandfather clock, faded letters, or other old objects. And experts, of course, comment on the historical context, the rarity and value of their artifacts. And of course, everyone enjoys watching the owners become overjoyed or stunned or fascinated and occasionally disappointed by what the experts say. Well, Genealogy Roadshow spins that format in a family history direction. PBS says, quote, participants want to explore unverified genealogical claims passed down through the family history that may or may not connect them to an event or a historical figure. Experts in genealogy, history, and DNA will use family heirlooms, letters, pictures, historical documents, and other clues to hunt down more information. These experts will enlist the help of local historians to add color and context to the investigations, ensuring that every artifact and every name becomes a clue in solving the mystery. This season, the hosts are some names you may recognize, Kenyatta Berry and D. Joshua Taylor, young but expert and enthusiastic voices in the American genealogy community. The cities hosting Genealogy Roadshow are Nashville, Austin, Detroit, and here in my backyard, San Francisco. PBS explains that these cities were chosen to these cities were chosen as American crossroads of culture, diversity, industry, and history, with deep pools of potential participants and stories. This has already been really a popular series in Ireland, where Genealogy Roadshow is in its second season. The series premieres in the U.S. on PBS on Monday, September twenty third. And finally, I am very proud to announce that uh, Genealogy Gems has made the list for the 101 Best Websites for Genealogy in 2013 by Family Tree Magazine. And uh, I do do their Family Tree Magazine podcast, but I'm always as surprised as anybody else. <laughs> I have no insider track on this. I, don't, I never even hear about it. And certainly this year, they had a category that we fit right into, Best Genealogy News Website. And that's for, both for the blog and the podcast. So... 
thank you so much, Family Tree Magazine. Really appreciate the uh, little nod and shout out. And of course, you'll definitely want to check out the 101 Best Websites list because, boy, have they got some wonderful sites you're probably familiar with, but also some new ones that are just blazing onto the scene and got them into some great categories by the kinds of research and activities that you might be doing in your genealogy research. Well, that's it for the genealogy news. Next up, we're going to hear from you. We will do that at the mailbox. From my old hometown One with some jokes From my old pal Jim Brown Bring me a letter From that girl of mine Saying that she's longing for me All the time Bring me a letter From my proud old dad that we are winning and I bet he's glad but more than any other a line from my old mother bring me a letter from my hometown I always look forward to uh, receiving your emails in my inbox. Always such fascinating uh, stories and ideas. I've got a couple here that brought up a couple of really good points. This first one is from Scott. He wrote in about some conflicting information on sources. He writes, I wanted to send this death certificate to you, and maybe you could talk about it on your podcast. It's a reminder that we can't take what we see at face value, even from a primary source created at the time of the event. On one line, it says he died January 17th, 1937. And another, it says the attending doctor saw him alive on February 17th of the same year. But then he was buried on January 20th. It's really not all that clear whether the events took place in January or February just from this document. Well, to me, what's really fascinating about this uh, death certificate that Scott has shared, and you can see it in the show notes for this episode, it's the number 159, it's how the slight variation in handwriting gives away the problem. The doctor was very detailed with the variety of dates that he entered as February when events took place. His number three generally stands up if you really look at it you know we, we've talked to Paula Sassy here on the show before about handwriting analysis and how much it does give away the doctor writes the number three in a very stand-up kind of way it even sort of tips forward a little bit but the registrar Mr. Popeland he distinctly tilts his three and his seven back a little bit and his hand is also quite a bit heavier very quickly you see that Dr. Brillier completed his portion of the form, and then I would guess Mr. Popeland, the registrar, completed the remainder of the form later, and he filed it. The big question was, who made the mistake? Was Mr. Popeland correct that it was January, or was Dr. Brellier correct that it was February? I searched on Ancestry and my heritage because, well, I can't stay out of anything, and I was very anxious to know the answer. And after an initial search, Neither Dempsey, who's named on the certificate, or his wife, Ruby Lee, appeared, which is kind of curious in itself. And after trying all kinds of name variations, I finally went back to my old friend, Google.com. So I searched on his wife, and I put in quotation marks, Ruby Lee Danner, and up popped one result, and it was a court case. I'll have a link for you in the show notes to this. It's very interesting. Uh, Searching for Dempsey Danner in quotation marks, resulted in seven hits, three of which were him, including an obituary at the Arizona Obituary Archive. In this court case, it says Dempsey Danner, here and after called deceased, on the 16th of February, 1937, was in the employ of one George H. Enos. 
here and after called the employer, on which date he sustained an injury by an accident arising out of and in the course of his employment, which approximately caused his death on the next day. Thereafter, Ruby Lee Danner, his wife, here and after called plaintiff, applied to the Industrial Commission of Arizona. And indeed, throughout this court case and document, and some of these other documents I came across, this all occurred, indeed, in February. So the mystery is solved. If you could look through these documents, Dr. Brailler has been vindicated. You know, maybe Mr. Popeland had filled just one too many certificates out that day, or he had his mind on something else as he entered January in those remaining blanks. And once again, the case is made that the person who was there at the time of the event typically gets it right, and the one who was recording this event later did not. And of course, this is a perfect example of how we never want to just sit back on our laurels. Uh, You may find a wonderful document, one that's even considered a primary source, but go for the second and the third documents if you can. Get those other sources, and uh, particularly where there's any kind of discrepancy, and you'll find that in total, they come together and paint a clearer picture. Thank you so much uh, for sharing this, Scott. I thought it was fascinating. And Kate shared some old-time photo resources that she came across. She says, I saw a reference to this in the post and went on the page. It's called Old Time DC on Facebook. Uh, It's brilliant. It's a collection of DC photos from the past. It's not owned by anyone, and anyone can post. The URL address that she gives is facebook.com slash oldtimedc. Kate says, I love looking at old photos, trying to figure out what the world was like before. I also love this idea because I've been working with my 76-year-old aunt, writing her and my mom's memoir. They're from Chicago, and I found some nifty YouTube videos and photos from long ago Chicago, and it helped bring back so many memories for my aunt. I immediately tried out old-time Chicago to see if there was something comparable, but that didn't work. It'd be so wonderful if people in various cities started compiling things like this old-time D.C. Facebook page. Many families have shared interest in various places and streets, but most people don't think to take photos of those things. I've been listening to your show for four years at least. I have gone through your archives to get everything you ever put together. Oh, gosh. Thank you, Kate. She says, you're so personable on the podcast. I always look forward to hearing your voice. Your show inspired me, and I already completed one huge family history photo memoir book of my grandpa's family. Oh, good job. That's awesome. She says, I had so much fun working with my mom's cousins and putting together stories about their parents. Well, I agree. This website that Kate has written about, this looks really interesting, Kate. Again, it's facebook.com slash oldtimedc. And you know, Kate, you really had the right idea, because when you find something like this, it's very possible it does exist for some other location. And you know, you did the search on Chicago, you didn't find it. But in fact, I've done searches on locations such as uh, Margate, Kent, in England, because my husband's family is from there. And um, sure enough, there is a Facebook page doing the same kind of thing. It's facebook.com slash Margate History. It's a terrific use of social media. It's a way that people can really easily share the stuff that they, they do have in common. You're right. The, the places and the times, all of the things that surround our families, those are shared. Those aren't unique just to us. And so what a wonderful way to be able to give back to each other. So uh, wonderful emails. Thank you so much, Kate and Scott, for writing in. And in our next episode, stay tuned, because there are more of you who are out there doing your genealogy blogging, getting your family history online in really cool ways. So, hey, if you've started blogging, because, you know, Lisa's been nagging you, send me an email with the link, genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, because I want to include you in episode number 160. All right? All right, I've got more gems for you coming up right after this. Oh, <laughs> 
from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I'll bet he's glad But more than any of all A line from my old mother Bring me a letter from my hometown I've got some great news for all you genealogists out there. Roots Magic 6 is now available, and it offers some of the most customer-requested features, like online publishing, the ability to search every record, not just people, an editable timeline view, which is really incredible, and new web tags, which lets you link people, sources, places, and research log items to web pages, plus dozens of other great enhancements, and of course, all the built-in features that you've come to enjoy. There is a little something here for everyone. Now, if you're already a devoted Roots Magic user like I am, or if you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and finally start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've just been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, there's no better time to get your copy of Roots Magic 6. Do it now. Go to RootsMagic.com and download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 6. You'll see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at RootsMagic.com. Gems contributor Sonny Morton interviews Dr. Deborah Abbott. Deborah A. Abbott, PhD, is an adjunct faculty member at the Institute of Genealogy and Historical Research at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama, and she currently serves as a trustee on the board of the Ohio Genealogical Society. Dr. Abbott specializes in African American genealogy, slavery, court records, as well as methodology. Her genealogical research project about an African-American family from Kentucky entitled From Slavery to Freedom to Antioch was highlighted in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, an Ohio newspaper under the title Six Volumes to Amplify a Family History back in 2008. I'm going to have the great pleasure of teaming up with Dr. Abbott as featured speakers at the Family History Festival being held at the Detroit Public Library on Saturday, September 28th of 2013. In this gem, Dr. Abbott shares her strategies for starting the search for African-American roots. This is Sunny Morton here today to introduce one of my genealogy buddies. We all have our genealogy buddies, people we do research with, people we talk about research with, people we go on trips with, whether we're researching or going to conferences or sneaking in a little spa day in between our trips to the courthouse. Well, my research buddy to introduce today is Debbie Abbott. We both live in the Cleveland, Ohio area, and I met her in conjunction with the African American Genealogical Society of Cleveland. She's a longtime veteran there who helps others find and record their family stories. Well, Debbie, I was hoping you would give us a few tips today for starting the search of your African American roots. What are a couple of your best tips? Well, Sonny, I usually suggest to individuals that they would start their search by first interviewing their family and their friends. Sometimes we find that we have relatives who know more information than we've ever been told and we also know that we have aunts and uncles who really aren't our aunts and uncles. And so those individuals know a lot about our families as well. They usually are people who are our mother or our father's 
best best friend and we call them aunts and uncles and they're not but they know a lot about our family and so when we're interviewing not only should we interview our blood family we need to interview our extended family you're right they do know a lot about our roots sometimes more than we do because they were around for the show any tips on interviewing especially our elders Yes. I always suggest that you make sure you ask questions that are open-ended. You don't want questions answered by yes and no. You want to generate some kind of feeling, make them think about where they've been and what was going on around them. You want to get a whole social history if you can. And so you want to ask the who, what, when, why, and how questions. I suggest always that if you're trying to get a date out of someone, you might want to ask a question about who was the president when you were born, or who was the president when you were six or seven years old, or 12, or 15. Ask them how they met your grandfather, if it's your grandmother you're talking to. How'd you meet them? And you'll be amazed at the stories that will come. Wonderful advice. Okay, now tell us some a couple of your favorite resources, websites, books. When you start researching a new family line, after your family sources, where do you go? I search now with Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org opened at the same time. Because as I'm researching, I will pull up a census record on Ancestry if I can't read it and I can't see what's there or I see a clue. The clue might mean I need to go to Family Search. Let me give you an example. On Ancestry.com for Ohio, they have the Ohio Death Index. That index goes from 1908 to 2007. If I find someone there that's in my, in my family history, then if they have died, or I think they've died, before 1953, then I switch over to FamilySearch.org because they have the images. And then oh. I can download the image. And then I have the actual record with me. So I go back and forth between the two. So I sometimes think of Ancestry as indexes, even though they have images as well. But I think of them as indexes, and I think of FamilySearch.org as the image. I think that's a great way to think about it. A lot of us do think of Ancestry.com just because they're really out there. But I'm surprised at how many people do not fully utilize the digital images on the free resource of FamilySearch.org. Now, I like that you mentioned finding things in these records because I think sometimes people with African-American roots are afraid they won't find their family in mainstream records, even after the period of slavery. Well, when we're doing the research, we start just like everybody else. We're going to start with, if you're using the census, you're going to start with 1940, and you're going to gather all the information you can back to 1870. That's where the difficulty comes, because before 1870, we are enslaved people, if indeed we were slaves. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of African Americans who were not enslaved. And if that is the case, you will find your ancestors listed in the population schedule, 1860, 1850, and so forth. And so it, if that's the case, then your ancestry is going to be a little bit easier. But as we move backwards and we move into that era of slavery, then we have to research the slaveholder. We don't always know who that is. It's important that we really look and analyze the census prior to that 1870 schedule. We need to make sure that we pick up all the clues, pay attention to the people who are in the house, because there could be generations in the house, generations that we don't know anything about. A great-grandmother, a grandmother, a great-great-grandmother may be their aunts and uncles, and they could hold the clues to what we need in order to help find the slave holder to a family. By the time we get to 1870, we need to start paying attention to the people who live around them. We need to look at names of individuals. Sometimes slaveholders and the former slaves may also have the same first name. 
we talk about the last name, and all slaves didn't take the last name of the slaveholder. But there are times when they did, and there are times when you may find the same first names in a black family as there are in a white family. And so once you kind of identify a potential slaveholder, then you need to research that slaveholder. One reason is once we get into that slave era, African Americans are no longer people, their property. That must be very difficult to look at records and see your ancestors in that context. It is difficult and it's painful at times because you want your ancestors to be just as human and vibrant as we are today. But the period does not allow for that to happen. And so it takes a lot of adjusting of your thinking. And you have to think about your ancestry during the slave period, again, as property, and that you're looking for things as you would a deed to a house. Uh, a bill of sales. Uh, that's where you're going to find your ancestry. And so in order to do that, you have to research the family or the person who's making the purchases, who has the transactions. And even when they die, you need not only to get a will, but you need a probate file, you need the inventory, you need the appraisals. Because if they own slaves, in the appraisals and the inventory will be your ancestry. I have found, as I have helped others with African American roots to trace their own families, I'm learning about much more than one family's experience as I take them down this road. I'm learning about American history. I'm learning about race relations, social customs and attitudes. It's a really eye-opening experience. Well, you know, what was really eye-opening to me, and I agree with you 100%, that you do learn about what was going on in the country. But what was really an eye-opener for me was the fact that I live in the state of Ohio. You live in the state of Ohio. And we've been taught that this was a free state. And so African Americans came to this state because they wanted to get out of slavery. They wanted to be free. They wanted to have opportunities. And what I've found is that our state had laws that governed the movements of African Americans. And it was restrictive. And so parts of it was almost like still being in slavery. African Americans who came to the state of Ohio in the early years, very early, 1804, 1805, they had to register themselves. They had to prove that they were not runaways. They had to prove that they were free. And so they had to go to the courthouse. They had to register themselves. They had to pay something like 12 and a half cents for the registration. But it wasn't long after that, around 1807, 1808, that what they had to do to register, it increased. They had to have two people to vouch for them. They had to register their freedom. And they had to pay a bond of $500. Now, I haven't found any actual posting of the bond, but I have found the registers. And the registers give you an insight of that person, where they came from. Uh, one of the persons that I was looking at was Jason Hicks. Jason Hicks, manumission from Virginia. His papers that he filed from Virginia told me how tall he was, told me that he had a deformed foot, told me that he's born free. He was never enslaved, and he's coming from Southampton, Virginia, into Ohio. And this was in 1837. You bring up a really good point in that the culture of race relations, slavery, and freedom, even well into the 20th century, really may vary by region. So um, I think it, it's a really good point that we need to look at our histories, our state histories, our regional histories, and learn more about the relationship between the races and the documents required of even free African Americans at the time. Well, Debbie, we could probably talk all day. Fortunately, you'll be telling us more about this at the Detroit Public Library in a free all-day session coming up on Saturday, September 28th. That's the main branch of the Detroit Public Library, and you'll be there all day headlining with our own Lisa Louise Cook. She'll be teaching everyone about using Google search and newspapers. And Debbie, what will you be sharing? 
I will be sharing information on the techniques needed to trace your African American roots. We will look at slavery. We will look at different documents and different things that will help to increase an individual's success in tracing African American roots. Well, we're looking forward to that. Again, that's Saturday, September 28th at the Detroit Public Library, a free all-day seminar with both Debbie Abbott and Lisa Louise Cook. If you'll turn to the show notes, you'll find more information on that. Well, Debbie, it's been really fun to introduce you to all of our listeners here at the Genealogy Gems podcast, and I hope some of you will say hello to Debbie when you see her in Detroit. Thank you, and it has been wonderful being here, and I hope to see you in Detroit. Profile America, Sunday, September 8th. This is National Grandparents Day, recognizing the love and help they provide and their growing importance to the survival of many American families. The special day was the idea of Marion McQuaid of Fayette County, West Virginia, and has been observed nationally since 1979. Today, grandparents are increasingly not just relatives to be visited on holidays and weekends, but part of the year-round household for many children. Some 7 million grandparents, together or separated, have around 5.5 million minor grandchildren living with them. Putting it another way, 10% of America's children under the age of 18 live with at least one grandparent, and almost 2 million of those grandparents are responsible for the children's care. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. On August 15th, I posted a pretty compelling video and article on my Facebook page about the importance of hard work and making your own luck, values I am fortunate that my ancestors passed on to me. The speech came from an unlikely source, a young Hollywood actor. In the video, Ashton Kutcher stands in front of a bunch of teenagers at the Teen Choice Awards talking about the importance of hard work. He said, when I was 13, I had my first job with my dad carrying shingles up to the roof. And then I got a job washing dishes at a restaurant. And then I got a job in a grocery store deli. And then I got a job at a factory sweeping Cheerios dust off the ground. And I've never had a job in my life that I was better than. I was always just lucky to have a job. And every job I had was a stepping stone to my next job. And I never quit my job until I had my next job. And so opportunities look a lot like work. The video went wildly viral, which is how I came across it. And it got me to thinking about my own work ethic. The credit for my work ethic sits squarely on my dad's shoulders and also my grandparents' shoulders and their parents' shoulders. My dad was the first in his family to get a college degree. He went to school and he studied all day and he worked in a local hospital morgue at night. (laughs) you can imagine. I remember later endless nights as a kid creeping up behind him as he sat in uh, his makeshift office in my parents' master bedroom, puffing on a pipe and studying for his CPA. We didn't have much in common to talk about, but it was what I saw in action that was communicating to me. Dad went on to become a successful businessman in a large company and later created several vibrant businesses. I guess it was that nonverbal communication between father and daughter that inspired me as a kid to pull weeds, babysit, and yes, even shingle the side of the garage to make a few bucks. And I vividly remember taking a temporary job caring for a 100-year-old woman for a couple of weeks one summer. She was testy at first as uh, she kind of felt generally ignored, but she warmed up to her inquisitive caregiver until... She was soon sharing stories of traveling as a little girl in a covered wagon. She'd found her audience, and I was entranced. At 15, I lied about my age so that I could get a job at a pizza place washing dishes. And within two days, they'd promoted me to cook, a position that a girl had never held in that restaurant. Later, I went on to my teenage dream job, sales clerk at the mall record store. And it was simply sheer persistence that helped me beat out all the other teens for that one. 
and then on to a job at Radio Shack, this time the first female to be hired in the entire state. And that was just as the TRS-80 computers hit the shelves. I started my professional career working for free at a travel agency just to get a little resume cred as I finished travel agent school and was the first in my class to land a job a week before graduation. I went on to working in corporate America where I received invaluable career development. But like my dad, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I've created a couple of businesses and positions for myself over the years and find myself now with genealogy gems, living my dream and drawing from all of my past experiences. There have been many challenges along the way. No one ever said work was easy. And in fact, my mom's favorite saying that was drilled into us as kids was, life isn't fair, get over it. She was absolutely right. And she removed the obstacle of fretting over fairness from my life so I could just get on with working hard and creating my own dreams. I was one lucky kid. Now, whenever a challenge arises, my instinct now is to say to myself, I can't wait to find out what future opportunity this dilemma is training me for. Almost without exception, I can look back over my past work experiences and I can see how they're helping me today. Some of the very worst have turned out to be blessings. So what lucky opportunities have you had and created? You know, we just celebrated Labor Day, and I hope that you'll drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com to share what you've learned from your previous generations. And here's the good news. Even if the most recent generations that came before you let you down, Family history offers you centuries to pull new and positive values from. Your ancestors were survivors, and yep, that's why you're here. You may have parents or grandparents who kind of went astray, but you have countless ancestors to find and learn from. And best of all, you get to pick which values that you want to embrace and which ones will fall by the wayside. Let us pass on what our ancestors taught us so our kids and our grandkids can enjoy the opportunities, the growth, reward, and the freedom that comes from good old hard work. Thanks for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. 